Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Ellen calling in from the beautiful island of St. Bart's, and you are listening to Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. And sister. You better believe it, Ellen. <laughs> How did she get in? How did she get in? <laughs> she got in. <laughs> the back door. <laughs> she, she gets in. She knows, she, she knows people. She knows people. So welcome, everyone, to episode 356. And today we have a really special guest for you. We'd like to welcome lighting designer, production designer, Brian Hartley to the show. Hey, Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Yourself? How's, how's life going? Uh, life is going great, man, uh, for all of us. And uh, real quickly, where are, you, where are you calling from? I'm calling live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Ooh, Sin yes, City. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's a great city, too, as well. I mean, I've been here like 15 years, and uh, over just the past eight years, this place has exploded. You know, with the Super Bowl, the F1 race, you know, EDC and all this stuff, uh, it, it's crazy here. But uh, it's awesome, and I made a great investment here with a couple places before it got so expensive. Oh, smart. So uh, now I have a couple places and all that stuff, so it's, it's pretty cool. I, lo- I love Las Vegas. Yeah, don't forget the porn convention, right? Isn't that, isn't and that's, that there? And that's happening, I think, now at this, at, at this month in January. <laughs> okay. Are you doing anything for that? Are you, uh, no, are you lighting no, anything? I'm not lighting oh, anything okay. for that. <laughs> Would be interesting, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, for our listeners who uh, are listening at home and not seeing this, uh, Brian has also made an incredible purchase in a microphone. That's right. And, uh, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about that microphone there? <laughs> I'm going to take a screenshot so people can actually see this because it's so damn awesome. And then oh, I'm going to show it like, like, oh, there's the color. Oh, I got it. It looked like the sphere for a second. It was like okay. morphing <laughs> down, you know? I got was, the sphere here at my house. I got the here. sphere. Just look out the window. The sphere's there. Yeah. Okay. Well, Ellen, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about Brian? I'd love to. Uh, Brian is a lighting designer, production designer, and director who has designed for many bands on stage and on screen, including the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, KISS, Meatloaf, Poison, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts, Megadeth, Anthrax, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Cheap Trick, Alice in Chains, Meatloaf, Chris Brown, and many more, in an incredible career starting in the mid-80s. His relationship with TSO has spanned over 25 years, and his designs for them are always out of the park, with a bold mix of projections, LED walls, lighting, pyro, and an incredible use of color. Welcome to Light Talk, Brian. It's great to see you here. Awesome. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Yeah, Brian, I have a quick question because you've designed for many of my favorite bands. Me too. One of them is Deep Purple. What was it like working with Richie Blackmore? Uh, Well, you know what? When I worked for him there, he was already gone. It was Steve Morris, the uh, Dixie Dreads. Yeah, he was great. And that was probably, that was uh, 97, right when I finished the Kiss tour, uh, the reunion tour with Kiss. And then I went with them and did uh, a few shows, right, with Deep Purple. And, uh, And we got to do Switzerland. And uh, and we did uh, Beirut, Lebanon, which was uh, which was very industri- interesting. And then this was ninety ninety seven, and then uh, so we did Beirut, Lebanon, and I lost my luggage, and Ian Pace, <laughs> the drummer, he we both lost our luggage, and we both got it back a couple of days later. Uh, but it was hot and crazy, and uh, and Beirut, Lebanon. But uh, it was awesome, and you know, and I got to, I, I hung out with those guys quite a bit, and uh, and you know, it was like me, Roger Glover, and uh, Ian uh, Ian Gillen, uh in in a smoke in a, in a hotel room uh, just smoking hash. Okay, so, you know, so, so I that was John, amazing. <laughs> I, I assume that John Lord was, uh, doing hash was just a little below his stature. Jo- you know, John Lord. I wasn't hanging with him, but. Uh, and it was uh, oh I can't remember the sound guy he passed away uh, years ago uh, uh, but he was an awesome dude we had we had a bl- we had a blast back then but uh, it was amazing because we were in Lebanon right and you know uh, uh, and back then you know it was always like the Lebanese hash or whatever and I remember we just smoked we just smoked this hash in a hotel room and I, I don't think we ever got high at all. But oh, we wow. just smoked tons of it, tons of it. It was uh, it was pretty funny. So that that was a pretty cool experience uh, with those guys, you know. Oh, it sounds like we need to just 
welcome everyone to a very special light talk after dark. <laughs> oh, <gee. laughs> That's right. We just oh. changed the date of the release to like after oh 11 God. p.m. So it'll we'll have a big warning, right? A big like uh, disclaimer yeah, yeah, on the go. top. You know, you know, if you're under the age of And that of was 18, 30 years ago, too. It was 30 oh, years ago. Is that okay? Ago, so. that, that means the statute yeah. of limitations is... Exactly. Right you know, it doesn't matter. Okay, point, there you, you go. Know. That's, that's so. good. That's really good. All right. So who wants to ask a serious question? <laughs> I want to I have a follow-up on, on, on Beirut. John Lord? <laughs> on Beirut? No, on Beirut. So Be- uh, what happened? Did you send a package over there? Did you pick up a local <laughs> supplier? And they, they – not okay. hash. Lighting. You're talking about oh, the and they, lighting. They, they, they flew so it down. It's Le- Lebanon, you know, Lebanon. So they uh, they have that stuff over there. And, uh, you know, back then you're not flying. with Today you don't really fly with anything. I wouldn't. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but we it was somehow not a, got it over there, and uh, and we played two nights there too as well, and it was amazing because it was a stage kind of on the and it was desert and it was kind of hot, but there was the <laughs> ocean there too as well, you know, and uh, that's pretty cool. But no, we didn't send no package over there. We got it uh, locally. So to get you know we've we've jumped in here with TSO and Kiss and Purple. You know, what did you say? Deep, Deep purple. purple. Deep purple. Yeah, jumped in here with TSO <laughs> and Kiss and Deep Purple. And uh, so you didn't start there, obviously. Where did you get your start? You know what? When I, in about the mid 80s, I, I was a guitar player in a band. I had my own band. So uh, uh, we had, I had a band in North Carolina. And it, back then, you only had to be 18 years old to play in clubs, right? Because the drinking age was 18, right? So uh, I was right about 17 and about to turn 18. And I went on the tour uh, in the summer in between my uh, 11th and 12th grade. And uh, and we played. I played in a band. We played cover songs. You know, ACDC. You know, Motley Crue. All this just kind of rock and roll stuff back then. And, uh, and and that's what we did. And I put together the lighting and the sound. And I had a car and a truck. <laughs> and that's and that's what we did. And we would play these week gigs. We'd play a whole week at like Hattiesburg, uh, Mississippi. Right. Play a whole week, and we would get paid like fifteen hundred bucks. And you get two rooms or a band house, right? And uh, you know what? At 17, 18, 19 years old, oh, get your credit. That was, uh, it was an incredible time. But uh, so I did that. And then once my band, we kind of broke up when I was about 20 or 21. And uh, and then at that point, I was trying to figure out what to do. And then there was a local band that uh, they were named Nantucket. And they were pretty popular. They had just finished an ACDC tour. So I just missed out on that. But they wanted a local guy uh, that had some lights. Uh, they want a lighting guy who had some lights. And I was going, okay. I said, you know what? I can do this. You know, I put together the lighting system and I was telling, I showed the guy how to run the lights, right? Uh, so I did. So I went on the road uh, with that band, Nantucket, and uh, with my lights. And uh, and I was doing lights for them. And I was going like, okay, this is cool. And then my buddy who was with that band, Guitar Tech, he got a gig with Joan Jett. Right. So he went with Joan Jett and then they needed a lighting guy. So he got me a job there uh, as a uh, as a lighting guy with Joan Jett. That's probably 84, 85. And uh, and then at that point, I went to New York because Joan was from New York. So I started I did the tour and then I came off from the tour and I didn't really uh, I wasn't I wasn't a lighting guy. You know, I wasn't anybody with any name at all. You know what I mean? So I would work with Joan Jett in the studio right so i would be the gopher kind of guy i would drive joan around i would you know i go to the deli you know you go drop off packages you know just the office guy or whatever but in that i got to record all these amazing great records <laughs> with joan jet in the awesome. place called the record plant oh yeah and there's another place called the hip factory oh, yeah. we did but it was mainly <laughs> it was mainly the record plant Right, and that's where they recorded like Imagine from John Lennon and and a bunch of Kiss records and Alice Cooper records or whatever, all that kind of stuff. So I got to I got to go in there. I did about four records, and I could t- I, since I was a guitar player, I could tune the guitars. So uh, I would take care of all the guitars in the studio. I'd tune them up, and then they would do the tracks and everything. And uh, you know that was a nice little period in my life. And there was one time where Joan Jett she wanted a. a she was playing on this other person's record, and we had to go to Electric Ladyland Studios, right? So we go there, right? I go there a little bit before I had Joan's guitar and her amp, and uh, it was for a band called Keel, right? And so I was in there getting Joan's set up and everything, and the producer, you know who the producer was? 
The producer was Gene Simmons. Oh, my okay? God. So this was like, <laughs> this is still like 85, 86. You so, go. you know, that's where I first met Gene. And I was just a guy t- t- taking care of the guitar for Joan or whatever. Uh, and uh, But I did talk with Gene about that like years and years ago after I worked with him. So that, that was pretty cool. But uh, so, yeah, just uh, doing the guitar stuff. And then uh, I, I, would, I got a couple gigs through like John Broderick. Right, uh, JB. He's uh, uh, he's been around for years. I don't know what he's doing now, but uh, you know, he's the one that really kind of helped me out. You know, he was an old Joan Jett LD, and then he became Metallica's LD for uh, probably about twenty years or something like that. Uh, but uh, he kind of took me under his wing and kind of uh, he got me a gig with New Edition. Right, this is New Edition. Uh, this is eighty five, eighty six New Edition. Right. Uh, so, uh, he got me hooked up with that and he let me do that, which was pretty cool. And he really, and he taught me how to call spots. You know, JB was an amazing spot caller and he just really focused on that pretty intensely. So, uh, you know, JB, uh, JB helped me out quite a bit and he was a New York guy and I was living in New York with Joan Jett and all that kind of stuff. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So, so you were like Joan Jett's guitar tech as well. Somewhat, yeah. yeah, exactly. I was the lighting guy, but when we come off the tour, you know, and I could set up the drums. I would set up all the drums, you know. I can't tune the drums, but I could set them all up. I set up all the guitars, and the the main thing was, uh, you know, uh, back then, you know, you know, there was no internet or whatever, cell phones. So I, I would always have to go to the deli and get the, the food or stuff. Come back. I would roll joints for Joan uh, constantly, <laughs> you know, which was uh, which was amazing uh, too okay. as well. I so think, uh, I think we now need to move into our joint rolling technique segment of the show. Oh no no because no no! We need to back up. We need to back up here for a second. Okay, okay so you're a young man. You've started your band, guitar of choice. What was that oh, yeah. first rock and roll guitar? Good question. Okay, so my guitar was it, uh, at first. My first one was uh, I got a Les Paul, like a wow. uh, like a kind of tobacco sunburst Les Paul. But I kind of like eh, you know I really loved Dave Murray. You know who Dave uh-huh. Murray is? Yeah, okay. So Dave yeah. Murray had this Strat <laughs> with the three pickups, right? And it was like, you know, I think it was like why with the uh, the black pick guard or whatever it was. I got it just like his, you know of what course. I mean? And uh, uh, and I was really a big Dave Murray fan. So that's what I really liked was that Strat, uh, you know, the white with the it's black. It's a lot lighter, too. Than the Les Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just, you know, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I loved Iron Maiden, oh, you know, yeah. and I love that guitar playing and all that stuff. I still love Les Paul, but, uh, you know, but yeah, there you go. I would have guessed the Strat, actually. That's what my yeah, question yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I have to tell you, I was going to guess the Les Paul. Whoa. I was going to guess the Les Paul. You know um, what? It should be, and you're right. It could, it should be Les Paul. But like I said, I was just so into uh, uh, Dave Murray and Iron Maiden and that guitar. I, I switched over there from that Les Paul. Well, talk a little bit. I'm, I'm sure people would like to hear this relationship you had with Kiss. It was Kiss your first major band, and if it was, how long were you with them? Well, I'm not sure their first major band, but I started with them in about. 93, 94. And I'd already did, I did some Megadeth stuff, uh, which they had a pretty big tour. So I'd already did Megadeth. And what else did I do? I did some other stuff. Trickster I was doing. And, uh, and then Joan Jett as well. So yeah, you know, I'll, I'll say Kiss was the first very, very big band. But when I started with them, they didn't have any makeup on. Right, so this is their period where they were just at, at the end of kind of their make their non makeup period. So uh, uh, I started with them there, and I I went to South America, and I went to uh, 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 Japan and South America, and I actually the first part of the Kiss thing I went down there with I had a guy with me named Dino DeRose. He was a dear friend of mine, and he had did lights for Kiss before me. So uh, uh, he had got me in there because he was doing something else or whatever. Uh, but he was a dear friend of mine. He, he passed away many years ago. Uh, uh, he used to do lights for widespread panic. And uh, he just Cinderella. He, he had a big uh, he had a big resume. But uh, but I, I started with Kiss like that. And uh, let me see where I was going. OK, yeah. So after that, uh, you know, there's still no makeup. And then they put their makeup back on. 
uh, in like 96. So I'd been there like a couple years and I did some stuff. We did uh, international stuff. And then when they put the makeup back on, to be honest with you, I, I was a little worried. I was going like, oh man, you know, it's, it's a new manager. It's Doc McGee. You know, he's got Bon Jovi. You know, he's going to bring in definitely David Davidian or, you know, Ali Olma from the Scorpions or something like that. So I was very, I was very nervous because the kiss, it was a big deal when they put their makeup back on and all four got back together. Uh, but you know what? They kept me and uh, Doc kept me and everything. And, you know, I did probably about another, you know, 12, 13, 14 years out of that uh, after that. And uh, so I was very happy that they kept me. And then I got to do the reunion tour, right? When they put mm -hmm. the makeup back on. And, uh, um, and they were all four together. And also, you know, you got to understand before I was in my band or whatever, you know, I was the kid in my room, uh, looking at the kiss <laughs> records, right. <laughs> intensely and, and reading everything and, and, and all the, everything that came in the, uh, the record covers, you know, you would always look, oh, yeah, we didn't great. have the internet. Are great. Yeah. Awesome. You know, that was, yeah. that was how we did. And it was so back then it was just so mystical and everything. It was just amazing. So for me to get a job and finally end up working with them and doing the reunion stuff, oh, you know, it it was amazing. You know, I I had to pinch myself a couple of times in uh, uh, Tiger Stadium because uh, we that was where we did the first show with the makeup on. It was like forty five thousand people, wow. and it was like, wow, you know, this is this is pretty cool. That's you know totally I mean? awesome. Hey, yeah, I have yeah. a question about Kiss because, um, mm -hmm. and we're gonna get into lighting. Actually, now I'm gonna segue into lighting again okay. from drugs okay. to <laughs> albums, the <to laughs> guitars, the <to> lighting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, we were talking earlier about our mutual friend, Andy Figueroa, who uh, worked on many KISS tours with you. And he, used to, he was my programmer for many shows here in L.A. And he used to tell me stories about the lighting on KISS because you were there when it started to get really big and really bold and a lot of audience blasters, you know, and, and, and sure. fire and, you know, and brimstone and all that stuff, yeah, you, know, yeah, yeah. you know, crazy stuff. Could you tell us a little bit how you kind of outdid yourself every tour? <laughs> because there was a standard, there was a visual, you know, sort of like Pink Floyd, you know, what Mark uh -huh. would do with Pink Floyd and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, every production design is an evolution. Sure. Right? Sure. So if you could talk a little bit about how that style happened with Kiss, it would be really fascinating. Sure, sure. I mean, with well, when I first started with Kiss and they didn't have the makeup, it was it was interesting with uh, uh, you know going to Japan and Australia and all that stuff. And I had tons of park hands, right? <laughs> I still had mo I had moving lights, but I still had tons of park hands. And then I think when they came around to the reunion tour, right? You know that one I was trying to. Uh, you know, I was trying to be more technological, uh, you know what I mean? Not so much of the park hands, and more of the moving lights, you know. And then back then we had the mole phase, and, you know, the mole phase were great, but we had color changes on there too, which, you know, we're good, we're good, but, you know, they were never perfect, you know. So, uh, but, uh, I, I, you know, I think with Kiss, you know, the lighting uh, – you know, uh, plays a good, plays a good part with them, and as well, the video does too. They've always been the kind of a band they want to see their faces on the screen and all that stuff. So, you know, as we kind of got started with Kiss and all that stuff, you know, I was trying to bring a bit of drama into it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, sometimes they got so the bright screens and everything are great, but man, ja, you know, sometimes you just don't have the drama. And uh, oh, there was one time with uh, when we were doing when they had the makeup and all or whatever. We had went to Japan, and for some reason we went to Japan and played Budokan. There was no video, right? I don't know what the situation was. They couldn't get video, whatever it was. So it was just my light show with my kiss sign. Right. And uh, you know what? That was probably one of the best shows, you know, no offense <laughs> to the video, but it was just really about the lights and, and, and my kiss sign. And uh, and in 96, when we did, they did that reunion, I made a kiss sign. Right. So I made a kiss sign out of the the actual logo. Right. So I had this big is like 20 feet by right. 10 feet, whatever it was. But it had a thousand uh, MR 16s. Right. And, uh, you know, I feel like that was a good uh, that was a nice addition to the Kiss show because, uh, you know, a I did it and I was very proud of the uh, of the MR 16s. Right. And uh, and we used it for uh, the uh, two tours right in the middle, like we always did. Right. And then for some reason, we had made two of them because so we can leapfrog, go to South America, whatever. So and then the Psycho Circus tour, I was like, oh, I'm going to use both of them. 
So I put one on each side <laughs> of the stage, you know, and and that had two thousand uh, MR16s. But then you needed four because you needed to leapfrog those two, right? Oh Jesus, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. And that was the three. We did a three D tour. Uh, where it was like Kiss in 3D. And I remember seeing Conan O'Brien uh, on a late night show. He goes, I just saw Kiss last night. It was Kiss in 3D. He goes, but wait. He goes, if I saw him live, isn't that Kiss in 3D? I don't understand, you know? <laughs> That's funny. It was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So what came next? Like, how'd you get to TSO from there and Paul O'Neill? Okay, so TSO, TSO came around uh, uh, via... Paul O'Neill. Okay, so in the mid '80s, again, once I was up there with Joan Jett in New York, and I was kind of doing those records or being the gopher, if you will, uh, with Joan, uh, I met Paul O'Neill in the office. It's called Lieber Krebs, and Lieber Krebs. They were in management for you know they were managed for ACDC, Def Leppard, uh, you know, Ted Nugent, and and Joan's uh, management was right in that same office. And uh, and then Paul was there. So and then Paul had a couple of bands. I worked with Heaven. Uh, he had Zig Zig Sputnik, and he also had this other band called Sabotage. Right. So this was the band that actually became TSO. Uh, and so this was a band called Sabotage, and I I did a tour with them. It was Sabotage, Megadeth, and Dio in '88, and that's where I met all the Megadeth guys. And, uh, um, and, and Sabotage. And then Sabotage, 10 years later, maybe 98, 99, 11 years later, uh, Paul formed this whole Trans-Siberian Orchestra around this one song. Uh, uh, Sabotage had a song called Carol of the Bells, or what, 1224 Sarajevo. And it was kind of had that little bit of Christmas stuff in there, right? And then after that, that song just took off. And nobody really wanted to say it was Sabotage or whatever because it was very unique. And Sabotage was like a heavy metal band. Uh, so they all they, they built this whole group, Trans-Siberian Orchestra, around this music and around kind of like Christmas and a story and everything. Uh, and then and then when Paul had that thing, he hit me up and saying, hey, I got this cool thing I think you'll be great for. You've always been my favorite light guy. And I was going like, awesome. Uh, and he sent me the music, and it was just like, holy shit. You know, this stuff is really, the music just fits with the lighting and everything. It's just it's just amazing. And, you know, about midway through the uh, TSO tour, Paul would come in and say, Brian, Brian, he goes, you're not going to believe this. He goes, I wrote a song with your lights in mind, you know? So he would always do stuff like that, which, uh, and he was an amazing guy, man. He, he's the reason TSO is what it is today, right? Because, uh, I mean, yeah, I designed it and all that stuff, but it was his passion and his intensity. Like, you know, yeah, Brian, that's great, but you know what? Double that. I want more than that, you know, (laughs) double it. And we would do crazy stuff like that. And, you know, he goes, I want the people to come see the show, Go and tell their friends, and then twice as much, uh, twice as many people come back next year. You know, and that's really what he did. And uh, he was never about Christmas, of all things. I know it sounds wacky, but he was on Brian. This is not a Christmas show. This is a fucking heavy metal show. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and and then there would there would be times where he would go like uh, I would show him a design or something like the castle, the toy box, or whatever we did, and he'd be going, you know what? He goes, Brian, he goes, that is fucking God. Let's do it. You know? <laughs> and uh, he was very animated, you know, really long hair, you know, Ooh. sunglasses, a leather jacket, you know. Uh, but, uh, and he was beloved by everybody. But, but he was very much of a nutcase, you know, just like, no, no, Brian, can we have fire in the audience? And he was like, no, Paul, you can't. Audience. He goes, why not? He goes, why not? Nobody else has ever done it. Well, I know for a reason. <laughs> but he was just that intense and he had a great passion for That's it all. Awesome. You know, so That's that was awesome. pretty cool. I think I think you almost touched on your process, but what ha- what ha- how, how's your process evolved? How you know what what advice would you give a, a younger version of you starting that first year with Trans Siberian and now? I mean, you've, well, you've you know done what? it all. I mean, I I for me personally, you know, I I was lucky because it really I was a part of something that was magical, and and we really didn't even know it at the time, you know, when it's really that small, so. You know, uh, but you know what it is, is, is for me, you know, I enjoy running lights to the music, right? That's what I like. I like creating something with the music. So, 
you know, and that's what I was back then. So, you know, a younger version of me, I, you know, I would tell him just do do exactly what you're doing and double it. You know, just 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 fine <laughs> and double it. Yes, of course. But uh, oh god, he Except was for uh, the hash. He, don't double the hash. <laughs> right. Oh no, no you no, got to You got to How do, do you it. think? How do you think I'm going to come up with this stuff every <laughs> single year after year after year? Yeah, <laughs> that's your inspiration. No, it's it's it's, it's interesting because you'll know, take. You've also seen a great leap in technology and you sort of mentioned it with the kiss thing about moving into moving lights right and uh, and then the mr60 all that stuff now with ai how is that affecting you i mean is that blowing your mind because it's blowing my mind i'll tell you that right now you know yes i mean forget about all the technology that's happened that's amazing all that stuff but just on that freaking ai thing <laughs> oh my god man it's just it, it really is incredible and I've, I've i've gotten really heavy into it over the past three weeks right with just stuff and just and i've created some amazing stuff right and anybody can you know if you spend the time and all that stuff but what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to take that stuff to the next level right so the stuff i've created I like it. It's amazing stuff, and nobody can, nobody in the world can create it because everything, you know, all that AI stuff is so. Anything is it's all different. There's nothing the same. Yeah, you can't original, really make but, something same. Yeah, you know, so it's all original. So I want to take some of my stuff and then try to animate that stuff, right? And if I can do that, oh man, Joel, the world has just changed when it comes to video content. So, so you're talking now video content mainly, but uh, other than lighting, that's interesting because uh, I've been I've been getting into AI too right, with uh, with some of the set and video designs I'm doing now, and uh, yes. it is just mind blowing at the stuff you can do. You know, it's you really want great. you want a spiral staircase. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you want a spiral staircase. You know, you type in spiral, right? And it gives you so many options. You can go like, okay, I like this. I don't like this. I like this piece, you know, uh, because I'm actually doing my TSO thing right now. And, uh, oh, man, AI has been amazing for uh, for ideas. I just type in stuff. I see it, you know. Boom, you could do another version of mm-hmm. it with a variation of it like that. And it, it really is. It really just stimulates your mind. It's, it's just amazing stuff. Which honestly. programs do you use? I do. I do on the uh, Discord with the uh, uh, with the uh, Mid Journey, right? And somebody was laughing. At me. It was only somebody saw me. He's like, like, "Dude, you're using Discord." And I was going, well, yeah, I mean, That's you what know, I use. my buddy, my buddy, is, he helped me set me up. Yeah. So I didn't even really know. He said Discord, he goes, it's like a chat, it's like an app or yeah, whatever, yeah. Chat, uh, like a chat texting chat. program. Yeah. But the way you use it with that, you know, is is crazy. My buddy's like, eh, like uh, some teenagers use. Well, they're, they're the ones who figured this out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, and it's amazing stuff, some of the stuff. And, uh, you know, I've just, you know, I when I was in that place in uh, Palm Springs, there was a guy, I called content guy there they were doing some ai and they showed me some amazing animations and everything that they were doing and uh yes i want to be full on on that and yeah. i will be with my tso thing coming yeah. up for sure cool. and for the listeners who haven't gotten into this what we're talking about is uh, a program called whoa 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 now hang on okay. a second now are you going to give out the, the the secret and everything uh, you're no, giving I'm out not to everybody out secrets. <laughs> I, I don't want anybody to know <laughs> no, about uh, man, discord well, or uh, mid journey no <laughs> i've never ever heard mid-journey, of that journey <laughs> mid journey is is uh, you know my brother was one who turned me on to cuz my brother's a photographer or you know, he's an artist in, in photography oh, yeah, yeah. so the stuff he's creating now is just so so mind blowing, but it's very inexpensive oh, and it's yeah, very right. easy to get into. And it doesn't take a lot of training. After a while, you get, I mean, the biggest thing is figuring out what prompts, how to write prompts, I think, sure, yeah, right? Yeah, course, but it is course. really a wonderful tool. We're actually starting to teach it in my university. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as you should, because eh, give it a little time and it's just going to be everywhere. You know, I see it everywhere now, you know subtly you know going back to lighting for a second what was on the most recent tour for the tso that you just came off of this one uh i had i had a little bit of collection of old things you know with tso sometimes you know i'll go for quantity instead of quality so to speak so i'll have like a hundred sharpies you know (laughs) And, and and still to this day with the sharpies uh uh you know they work they go, right. And if you got enough of them, you know, they really do make an effect. 
But uh, I had that, but I had uh, some PRG uh, lights that they, they made LED, the Best Boys. Yeah. You know, they were ones. okay. Yeah. They were okay. You know, a bit older or whatever, but and retrofitted to make LED, and, and they were okay. But you know what I had? I had these VL3600s, right? And, man, I tell you what, those things were gorgeous. Man, they were beautiful. And yeah. I only had six of them because I, I lit my big nutcrackers that I had I had these big inflatable 23-foot uh, nutcrackers that I lit, and I used these 3600s. And uh, and then I started, once I got into it and started using whatever, and then I only used the nutcrackers for five songs, so I ended up using these other six lights as, like, you know, you know front uh, uh, center stage light or guitar solo and stuff, and it's just, it was so intense. I was going like, holy shit, I like these uh, 3600s, man. They were just beautiful and very nice, bright kind of, bluish white you know what i mean it was really really white you know and it, it looked beautiful so they, they did a good job on that light so that one and and what else oh yeah i had these i uh, had the, all these uh, jdc lines right which i think they've been around or whatever but uh you know uh i just love those things man the jdc i use jdc's and the jdc lines and those JDC lines were just absolutely beautiful, you know, and I had to tone them down to probably maybe about, you know, 50%, you know, just so I could hit all this stuff in white and flashing and all this stuff without killing everybody, you know, but still being enjoyable to watch. And then what else did I had? I had a, a couple hundred spikies, right? Uh, which those, uh, uh, those things, the, the, the spikies are awesome, you know, they've been around for a while too. I've used them for many years, you know. And then the wash lights I used were uh, Ayrton Magic Panels. And here again, they've been around for a while, too, as well. But, you know, a lot of this stuff, I can get a ton of them cheap. You know what I mean? So uh, that's kind of why I use some of it, you know. Next year, I still haven't figured out the lighting yet uh, uh, as, as to what I want to do. But I'm sure it's going to be something similar. You know, it's so amazing that the manufacturers are creating all these lights now. <laughs> because I was thinking back, you know, when we were interviewing Mark Brickman uh, a couple of years ago. He was telling us about the time when he had to retrofit some uh, telescans yeah. with searchlights from police helicopters. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> which is crazy, right? But he, he wanted that power. And I think he sure. used it on the, the, one of the Genesis tours. But anyway, um, nowadays... We're blessed to have all these manufacturers creating all this amazing equipment, right? You know, there's a million, million of things out there that are, uh, it's just a ton of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And the LED thing has just uh, brought uh, lighting to another whole world, right. you know what I mean, over the past 10 years, you know? You know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, because you're a musician, I'm a musician, I play uh, keyboards, and back in the old days, you had a Hammond organ, you had an electric piano, you had an acoustic piano, and a clavinet. Maybe a Moog, right? Nowadays, you can have any sound you want, any sample you want, right? The technology has reached that point, you know, for like $1,000. You know, it's not even expensive. And the guitar player is the same thing. You can have a pedal board with all these effects in it that you don't need sure. a Marshall anymore, right? No, no. The, I think the, 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 the playing field is level kind of on the recording side of things, right? Because used to, you would have to do what I did and uh, by what you did back in the old days. You go into the studio, you do all this stuff. Nowadays, you know, you don't have to. You know, somebody can do this stuff in, a, in, in their bedroom and it could be a number one hit all over the world. Well, Tom Schultz. You know what I mean? Tom Schultz recorded that first Boston album in his basement. Yeah. Yes, exactly, and that was that was a long time ago too. That was as well. a long time I'm ago. I'm saying now, now these people, like even kids, you know, 15 year old kids, you know, they can produce an album and put it out, and uh, you know, and it go viral, and it's and it's huge, you know. I think that's uh, and, and I think it's the same way with lighting. There's so much lighting out there, you know. The band down the street that's playing the lounge over here, you know, they got 40 sharpies, you know, and they got <laughs> you know they got all these lights, tubes, and everything. Thing, you know uh so i think it's i think a lot of people have more access to everything so which is great you know because i didn't when i when i was doing my band i had to buy the uh the par 64s from altman right and then i had to get the uh, uh the par can uh, the bulbs and then i had to get the acls and i had to wire the acls in series right. you know <laughs> but that's what you did 
Thank you. Howard Underlider, he's the one that figured out that whole uh, ACL thing with the, uh, you know, doing four of the series and right, everything. Right, uh, he did that years ago with uh, with uh, Rush and C Factor. Whatever happened to the millions of park hands that used to be out there? Where are they? You know what? So where was I at? I was at some little lighting company over here, and this guy had all these park hands. I was going, what are you doing? He's, I, he goes, I literally do nothing with them. He goes, I'm... I'm he goes, I should throw them out, but he goes, they're just sitting there. He had rows of park hands <laughs> and everything. And, you know, over the years, you'll see where, you know, people throw away a hundred of them or whatever, or they just try to give them away and uh, they're just kind of useless. In my garage right here, I have uh, this button because I used to be an icon operator. When I started with Kiss, uh, actually, the very first Kiss I, uh, show I did was on an icon console, which was LSD. Uh, that's who it was. Nick Jackson and those guys. They they made the icon console and the icon uh, uh, board. But in my garage, I have an old icon, and these things are big. You know, these <laughs> things are big and clunky. And my buddy gave me. I was like, oh yeah, because I used icons the entire existence, right? But they're gone. They're not. They don't exist anymore. But uh, I used them, and then he gave it to me. The thing about it is, he gave it to me when I lived in my other place in Vegas, which was. Uh, you know, which was 14 years ago, right? And then I brought it to my house here. So it's sitting in my garage here. I don't know why. I just need to throw it out because it's just been <laughs> sitting there for like 14 years, you know? I took some icons out on the road and uh, the guys at Bandit Lights looked at me and said, we're, we're not going to send those out. And I went, why? And they, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they I said, why? And they looked at me and said, uh, you and what nuclear physicists are going on the road to keep them working? I wouldn't throw them out. I'd put it on line and somebody you can put them in Brian, brian's garage i mean you know what i would there's a you know uh andrew gumper uh uh yep, yeah sure. yeah he's got that big now up at his place uh he's got a he's got a museum uh, and he's got all these li old lights. He's got a Selco Gold up there. He's got a he's got a mm. lighting museum up there, and uh, he already has a couple of these icons. And because oh, I wasn't okay. giving this one, you know, but uh, he's got like old studio spots, studio color. He's got a, it's like a little mini lighting museum up there. Oh, that's so. cool. Yeah, that is cool. When you talk about this older technology, is there anything you still have a sweet spot for and you think, yeah, I'd like to use this again somehow? Eh, no, not really. I mean, the park cans were cool, but I mean, you know, it wouldn't be, it just wouldn't be, you know, you would just wouldn't do that now. You could do it for like a video shoot, which I see that happen a, a few times. And, and sometimes you get these award shows and you'll see them, they'll use a bunch of uh, pars, you know. Who knows if it's really par cans inside <laughs> of the bulb in there or not, but they look like par cans. But, uh, you know, no, the I mean, the ACL was my favorite thing. You know, the ACL was, uh, uh, and when the other guy, Paul O'Neill, I was talking about, right? Oh, dude, he was a freak about ACLs. And he would not, he would almost not give these things up. And it got to a point, I was like, Paul, I got these new ACLs. And what they're called is they're Sharpies, right? <laughs> but yeah, and, and then he saw, and I showed him these things. He goes, yeah, I love those. So uh, I finally got rid of the ACLs uh, with TSO probably about, That's I don't funny. know, 2010 or something like that. I remember when the Sharpie came out, and I was at LDI that year, and I was with Ann Militello, and, and she said, because I asked her, I said, what, what, what are you looking for? What are you looking She goes, there's this new light. That's coming out. It's called the Sharpie, and I got to see it. So we got into the Clay Packy um, private room upstairs. This is back when I they actually invited me to these things. They stopped doing that for a good reason. But <laughs> that's another story. But we were up there, and we saw this thing in, like, this little room. And I swear <laughs> it was going to burn a hole through, this, through the wall. Yeah, I was yeah. amazed. I was just amazed at this. At this life. Yes, yeah, amazing. And it's lasted for so I long. Know. I mean, I, it's crazy, huh? I got I, on TSO when they came out. I said, Oh, I got to have some of these. Let me get like, 20, you know, 16 of them or something like that. And they were just a big hit. And so, and they still are. Well, they, they become still, iconic, uh, they basically. It's an iconic yeah, yeah, life. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they, they, yeah. they definitely uh, had a hit with that one. That one's a good one and long lasting. So, yeah, that's for sure. So, after you nixed Paul's request for fire in the audience, you do put some, <laughs> you do put pyro on stage stage though right we got a ton of pyro on stage and you know one of the things with tso i did in the early years i was going like i want to put it in the seats right so i i put it in the seats uh kind of along the uh, um 
Well, when the seats were be on on each side of the stage, we'd clear that out because we weren't we weren't quite selling all the uh, the uh, sold out arena at that point. So I had some space, and I, I did that for a while. And then I always had pyro behind me at front of house. So we've always had uh, pyro at front of house, and it's always tricky because one time I had this freaking pyramid. You know, <laughs> I had a pyramid. That would come up and it was video all around it. And this thing would open up like that and four sides. And this thing would be 32 feet wide, right? This pyramid thing would come open up in four, four sections and then fire would go up there. <laughs> it was, uh, it was pretty intense, man. Uh, so we've always done some kind of crazy fire stuff like that in the audience. How close were you to the fire, to the pyro? You know what? This year I made another pyramid, <laughs> not as intense as the one I just explained to you, but this one there, and it literally was probably at right at the edge of the riser for me. There was a couple of times I was going like, okay, uh, hello, somebody, <laughs> hey, guys, I don't mind. I like it. But when the pyramid would turn, it would encroach on the uh, riser about a foot and a half, you know, so... I was like, no, we got to, we got to move it back a little bit, you know, but, uh, but yeah, we always do some cool stuff out in front of house and, and in front of house, maybe a couple years ago, I had a Tesla coil, right? Oh, so wow. I had this amazing Tesla coil and then I, and then I put two things of flames in the top of the, uh, Tesla coil that shot out fire and uh, that was another There are high school too. students right now writing all this down. And they're about, they're yeah, about to go to science yeah. class and go, well, <laughs> what's a Tesla call? Oh, oh, yeah, but, uh, yeah. Well, you know what? With TSO, man, I, I got to tell you, I, I've had the, uh, you know, the fortunate thing of just designing all these crazy things over a 25-year period, you know? So, uh, and the, the, like I said, then this year we just did, you know, this one, I got into the inflatables, right? And I made, so behind me this year, I made a snow globe, right? And I put a girl inside of it singing a song, right? And uh, you know what? It was just, I've had the snow globe idea for, for a few years, but I was kind of waiting for the story that it kind of goes with, but they would just didn't have it done. And so I was going, I'm going to do a freaking snow globe anyhow. So, <laughs> and, uh, and I did, you know what? And it was a huge hit, man. Everybody loved it. So, uh, you know, that's, that's cool technology, stuff like that. And I had those big, tall nutcrackers that were 23 foot high and, uh, and they were just gorgeous. They looked like real nutcrackers. And so did the snow globe. Snow globe looked uh, real, you know, and then you put a girl inside of it singing a song and it goes up in the air and spins around. Uh, you know what? I was very proud of that one. That How long was, is the I'll, day? I'll like How long does it take to bring TSO in and get them out? Oh, TSO, you know, you got to figure they, they'll they probably start, they start chalking like at five, right? 5 a.m. And then load in at six, right? And then we go all the way up until maybe about 1230 and I'll do a little focus. I'll do about, you know, half hour, you know, 40 minute focus, if that, uh, and then boom, the doors are open for the first <laughs> show at three o'clock. Okay. Wow. So, you know, we'll, we'll do doors at two o'clock, right? Two o'clock in the afternoon and, and do that. And then we do that show. And then there's a short, you know, hour and a half, two hour between shows. And then we do another show at uh, eight o'clock at night or seven thirty. And, uh, you know, you do that Wednesday's a single show, you know, Thursday's a single show, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are double shows, right? So you're doing six, you know, and seven and eight or two, you're doing eight shows in five days, right? Now, if you count the other tour into it there, you're doing 16 shows in five days. Wow. How much time do you spend in pre -vis? Previs, you know, previs, I go uh, about a month, you know, mm -hmm. leisurely, you know, not every kind of, not all day long, whatever, but, uh, you know, I'll spend a good, a good month on the previs and I use the pants and, uh, uh, and this year, uh, this year would be nice because I, with the TSO, sometimes I go from year to year, depending if the design is similar or what the lights or whatever, but this year I'm starting totally from scratch and uh, I'll be on all my MA3s. So uh, I've just purchased a bunch of MA threes uh, over the past five years. Uh, so I got uh, I got six of those, and I'm gonna get two more, and that's gonna fill out my entire TSO for both shows uh, uh, with the Grand MA. I, I was a hog guy for many years, 
and uh, and I've just recently sold my hogs, or sell, I'm in the process of selling them, and it's just going to be all the MA3, Yeah. So just to clarify for people that you are out there every night running this show on the yes. East Coast or West Coast. I do it on the East Coast, and uh, you know I've been there. Uh, I've been doing the East Coast since the beginning. On the West Coast, I have a, a, a gentleman. His name is Michael Keller. Right, and he's kind of a uh, he's kind of an old school lighting guy from many many years ago. He's been he's done Aussie for the past twenty years. He's worked with Peter Morris and stuff like that. So he runs the lights for me on, on the West Coast. You know, so there's a and, double tour going at the same time: East Coast, West Coast. Exactly, and they're identical. That's, and the music's identical, and you know, I even I, I get the so so that I can keep it the same. You know, I do do quite a bit of time code, you know, but uh, you know, but some of it I run manually. But uh, you know, that's I, I I I do the time code there because it's just two different. Not to say that Michael could do it at all by 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 any means, but you know what, it keeps it really uh in time. It makes the band, they have to play this exact same thing all the time. So we know, so I know my show over there is actually me running the board. Right, right, you know right. what I mean? Via right. the time. There's so much going on with the yeah. lighting and the video and the moving set pieces and the girls in the snow globes and the pyro. And, <laughs> you know, you have to use time code. Well, you know what? It yes, it does because it starts with you know starts with time code, but it also starts with if you're using time code, you know the band has to play the same thing. They have to play the exact same thing, so that keeps them and that keeps everything. And and my 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 laser guys, you know, they take advantage of the uh, of the time code too as well. And the pyro guys take advantage of it in certain uh, certain situations. But uh, you know what? It does help it keep it very uh, very together. You know, and especially when you're dealing with two different. Uh, uh, you know, sets of people, you know what I mean? So, uh, just, uh, uh, you know, a person can have just a, a, a guitar playing different stuff can have an influence on the whole thing, but they have to play it the same. So it really keeps it, uh, the same on both sides. Yeah, so yeah, it's locked in. And that's when it all started, you know, way back, you know, when they first started to get even video in, in sync with Pink Floyd and Genesis and bands like that, sure, they sure. were using a lot of time code back then and with tracks also playing tracks. You know, I don't care, you know, who you are. I know people sometimes say, oh, I don't need that. You know, well, I mean, you know, sometimes you do in, in order to make it right. You know what I mean? Because you're just not going to be able to do it humanly like that on, on such a big scale like that. So we're kind of running out of time, Brian. And we could talk forever, but we always ask this question, you know, when we have a lot of really, really famous people on the show, people like you and other amazing people, you know, who've are superstars in the lighting industry. They're old, basically, is what you're saying. They're old, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that being said, you know, we're also educators, and uh, we have a lot of students who want to become lighting designers, and we have a lot of students who want to get into your field. You know, they sure. love busking, they love live music, they're musicians, you know, who want to get into lighting. What sort of advice would you give these young artists who want to do what you're doing? Oh well, you know, I, I, you know, I think the opportunities are amazing this, uh, this time for young people, you know, and you know, people always ask me, you know, what should I do to get into this, you know, you know, a depending on how old they are, you know, I say go to clubs, you know, uh, you know, there may be, uh, you know, and now in this generation, you got EDC clubs, <laughs> and some of these places got more lights than I ever had when I started <laughs> out, you know what I mean? So they're already starting out on another level, but you know, go to your local lighting companies, you know. You know, you know, sometimes your church, you know, uh, you know, theater, you know, high school, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the reason I'm here is my passion for music. That's why mm. I'm here. It's, it's, I mean, it's about lighting for sure, you know, but the reason I'm here is because of music. So, you know, and if you're passionate about music, you know, you'll do whatever and you'll, 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 I feel like if you're a musician or if you're like that, you know, you give it all you got and you'll, you'll, you'll succeed, you know, as long as you just give everything you got. And I almost feel like sometimes with the musician type things, it's sometimes better to be a lighting guy, you know, because I tell you what, I know, I know friends of mine that were amazing guitar players, better than me and all that stuff and they stuck with playing guitar i get it uh but you know what they're still in the same hometown 
they never did anything at all. They just they kind of play guitar. Maybe that's what they want. But I was kind of looking to kind of like, you know, succeed on a higher level, you know. So, uh, uh, you know, these young people today, and there's there's plenty of like full sale. There's that kind of stuff. But, you know, my thing is more go to a club or, or work for a local DJ that has lights and all that stuff. You work with local bands. But do they even have bands like that anymore that play around in clubs and stuff like that? Yeah, I'm in one of them. <laughs> Oh, really? Okay, well, then there you go. But we don't have any lighting systems, believe it or not. Yeah, we yeah, can't afford yeah. It. Oh, what do you mean can't afford it? Everybody can afford it nowadays. But uh, hey, man, you know, if, if you're into the music, this is the perfect place to be with the lighting and everything because uh, I'm so fortunate because I love music so much and I get to create all this stuff with music. And, uh, you know, that's just an amazing thing. So I'm very fortunate on that. Yeah, you're, you're preaching to the choir here with me because <laughs> that's why I do it. It's so great to have you on the show today. We've been admirers of your work for for decades. And oh, uh, for kind of to our audience, and uh, a lot of our audience are younger, when we talk about TSO, that's Trans-Siberian Orchestra, and if you haven't seen this show, you have to see this show. It is one of the most spectacular shows I've ever seen. It's different every single year, right? So now this coming up here, year, uh, it doesn't matter that you didn't see last year. Wait till you see this one. And Ellen, you or you, all you guys, you got to come check it out. Wow, yeah. I haven't been in probably, I don't know what, six or seven years. Yeah, what, yeah. When do you start? When does the tour start? Well, uh, with TSO, it starts officially like right around November 15th. Thanks again, Brian. It's great to have you here. And thank you so much from the entire Light Talk family. Appreciate it very much. All right. Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tell us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website at lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate, the Snoop Group with the legal team of Sparks, Burnout, and Chase will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sister, coming to you from Las Vegas, Long Beach, St. Bart's, and the Lone Star State. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more lighting shenanigans and serve you more of our casserole of nonsense. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. Well, we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Bye-bye.